I can put it above you, don't worry. Yeah, so, so whatever you like. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And everybody be quiet so that you can hear. So, uh, uh, well, okay, so lesson number one, if we're going to use microphones, I think we better uh, use the ones uh, at the uh, front uh, table there for panelists. Uh, well, welcome everybody, good morning. Uh, of course, we're all uh, here today to, uh, to, to honor Anwar, who uh, uh, we're pleased to see sitting front and center. Uh, we're going to begin with some opening remarks, first of all from uh, our dean, um, Alex Olenikoff, and then uh, Sanjay Reddy, who is the chair of the economics department. So, uh, Alex, if I can invite you to, I think, I think we'd better use I'll be very brief. Yeah, there's not the microphone. <laughs> okay. Um, look, it's my real utter pleasure to kick off this wonderful celebration on your youth and your, your work. You, you retired before I, I became. I think you need to put the mic closer. You retired before I became a dean, and we only had a few interactions before then. But, but I'm getting to know you better and better. And here's why: it's because when I meet economics along, along us of NSSR, and I asked them about their experiences here, who inspired them. Your name invariably comes up, and they have stories about you, and that goes for generations of, of students. So I learned about you at, very, at all these various stages, and when I asked them about our reputation in the world, um, it's clear to me that you constituted really the, the cornerstone of our heterodox department been responsible for that uh, reputation. Uh, Anwar joined the economics department, as many as you know, in 1972, and I think at the time was younger than any of our current students are now, um, and your first journal publication came shortly thereafter, that's 50 years ago this year, 50 years ago, and I actually sort of did some, a little bit of my own research and found that that paper I had cited in an article last October. How many of us can say that our work was cited 50 years ago? It's just incredible. And of course, that was just the first article. Many, 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 many that followed on competition and growth and profit, international inequality that uh, will continue to impact the field for a long time in the future. Um, generations of new school students have benefited from your, your mentorship and, and your teaching. A lot of them have gone on to make their own mark in the economic world. Uh, and uh, and in policy as well. I'm thinking here the most recent example being uh, Heather Boucher, who's now a member of the Biden Administration Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, there's an old phrase for that, a boring from within, I think is the phrase. Uh, so, good work on that, on one. Uh, anyway, I'm delighted that the students have organized this day, and Mark has organized this day with his colleagues uh, to celebrate you uh, and your contributions to the Academy and to the world. Congratulations. Good morning, uh, everyone. I'm uh, Sanjay Reddy. I'm the chair presently for my sins of the economics department. Uh, it is, however, a great and true pleasure to um, welcome you all to this day entitled Competition, Conflict, and Crises, a Celebration of the Economics of Anwarshi. <coughs> Some of you have traveled. I talked to at least one alumnus who's traveled here all the way from Brazil to be at this event, or other countries from Europe, um, from India. So we're very, very, um, you know, we're very pleased to have you all. But that's also a testament to, as Alex put it, the reach of um, Anwar Sheikh in the world through the alumni of the New School in particular, and through his his ideas. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of the department, so I'm not going to indulge myself too much, but I won't be able to be here this evening when I hope other people will indulge themselves and speak about Anwar in a more personal vein uh, during the reception and speak to him in a more personal vein. But let me just say on behalf of the department that his 50 years of service is, of course, uh, something that to say we appreciate would be the most anodyne possible <laughs> remark we could make. It has shaped this department in a truly profound way, and the reverberations are being felt every day, not least because we are uh, asking 
uh, ourselves how we can possibly fill Anwar Sheikh's shoes in our curriculum and in our advising. Now let me also take this opportunity to thank um, the organizers uh, of this event, uh, Clara Mate and Mark Setterfield, and um, also uh, Danielle Twist and Spencer Brown, our graduate students who played a vital role in organizing today's event, and of course, Silvina Palacio, our department senior secretary, who has done, as she always does, um, extraordinary work in making this, uh, this event possible. Um, now, in a slightly more personal vein, and uh, I will restrain myself here, or attempt to do that. Uh, those of you who know Anwar will know that he embodies many qualities, sometimes surprising combinations of qualities, and I think that's part of what makes for the, the, the high tension and the energy <laughs> that uh, Anwar um, um, uh, emanates. And one of those that I think, I think about is being quite, quite an interesting pair of qualities is that he's both gentle and fierce. Um, I'm sure that <laughs> all of you, many of you have experienced that. But there are other, other examples. In terms of his intellectual qualities, I would say that the, the first quality, and Aristotle considered this, as you know, the first virtue, first intellectual virtue also, is courage. And I've also written about this in my short uh, piece for the New School Economic Review, our student edited journal, which had a special issue in honor of Duncan Foley and Anwar Sheikh, where there are a number of articles written by faculty and students. Um, Anwar's courage uh, stands out in facing the profession and in facing the world, sometimes in facing the university, and standing by the values that he has believed in. And this is what has allowed him to eke out his own path, develop his own project, and act as a beacon, intellectual beacon, to many people in the world. Of course, closely connected to that is perseverance, extraordinary qualities of perseverance, his 50-year record in the new school in this place. <laughs> Those of you who are, have been here know it can be a challenging environment, <laughs> testifies to that not particularly well sung, mostly unsung in those years, many years. Uh, radical in the intellectual sense of the word and the political sense, but I will focus here on the intellectual sense. Getting to the roots of things is the etymology of the word radical. And in Anwar's work, this shows in his uh, evident interest in theoretical foundations. You know, we have a compulsory uh, part of our curriculum, which refers to foundations. He has an interest in getting to the theoretical foundations of things, understanding at a certain level of depth, but also in a manner that's unifying, perhaps reflecting his background in uh, physics and in engineering, the search for general laws and principles if they can be, can be found. Um, and of course, commitment, commitment to an intellectual project but also commitment to a moral and a political project. And I think all of these are qualities that we can learn from as students, as faculty, as thinkers, as people. Anwar Sheikh has become almost synonymous with the department. I think there are very, people, very few people in the world who know of the New School Economics Department who can think of it without thinking of Anwar Sheikh. Not that he is the only person who is so deeply integrated with the history of the department, but certainly it would be impossible to think of the history of the department and its influence in the world without speaking of Anwar. Uh, and perhaps I should also mention one other thing, um, which is that Anwar has been interested in bringing the tradition of classical political economy uh, into dialogue with modern methods. And that's something, of course, which some of the other faculty in the department historically, certainly Duncan Foley and others also, have been committed to and something we hope to, to, uh, to continue. So I don't want to, to uh, keep you from the substance of today. Let me just say that, uh, Anwar, we already miss you. 
and we will continue to miss you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for everything that you've done. Before I present the speakers, I just wanted to say how grateful, immensely grateful I am to Anwar for being a unique mentor and an intellectual inspiration. And I owe the fact of having had the opportunity to be a faculty member here at the new school all to Anwar. Anwar found me, um, kind of I wrote to him in an email and he discovered the, my dissertation work that no one had considered as useful until that moment. Anwar was the first one to tell me, you know, this is important for economics. And I came here, I gave a seminar, and now it's history. And all the, also the advice and the criticism uh, in the project of writing the book was truly fundamental. So um, all my heart goes to Anwar, and, and we are really happy to be here together. So I am uh, have the privilege to present the first two um, professors who have actually given us some um, written testimonials. And so I will present the, the professor, and Danielle will read the testimonial, and then we will call up our first three speakers to actually have um, the conversation here together. So the first testimonial comes from Kumaraswami Bella Belupilai is currently a senior visiting professor at the Madras School of Economics and was a faculty member at the new school from 2013 to 2015. Professor Belupilai has published two books on computable economics and edited two volumes on macrodynamics and computable economics. In addition, he has published widely on mathematical economics, political economy, and behavioral economics. Here's his testimonial. I was a graduate student at the University of Cambridge's Faculty of Economics and Politics when Richard Goodwin, or Joan Robinson, alas, I do not now remember who, gave me Anwar Sheikh's Humbug article, Laws of Production and Laws of Algebra, the Humbug Production Function, from the February 1974 issue of the Review of Economics and Statistics. This was an extract from his 1973 doctoral dissertation written under the super supervision of Ronald Findlay, who was himself supervised by Robert Solow at MIT for his PhD, Theories of Value and Theories of Distribution at Columbia University in New York. I had taken a doctoral course on capital theory at Lund University, where the main text was Harcourt's wonderful book on some Cambridge controversies in the theory of capital, which had just been published 1972. There was nothing in that book on shape. In any case, I was not able to digest completely Harcourt's book on capital theory and Sheik's paper, or Solo's comment on it, till years later, although the paper had been blessed immediately by the Cambridge UK Keynesians. I read Sheik's paper almost religiously and Harcourt's, macro and Harcourt's book till the importance of it dawned on me. In my graduate course on macroeconomics at NSSR, in the academic years 2013 to 14 and 2014 to 15, I spent some time on the capital controversies between the two Cambridges in Shake's paper and Harcourt's book. Evidently, Shake spent a great deal of time on studying the institution of capitalism from the perspective of Marxian political economy and came out with his magnum opus in 2016, Capitalism, Competition, Conflict, and Crises. The book generalized the Humboldt article, according to me, from three standpoints, foundations of the analysis, theory of real competition, and theory of turbulent macrodynamics of a ceaselessly changing economic system that was in its essence capitalistic in nature. He is the true successor of Schraffa, although Sheik emphasizes the Marxian roots of the analysis. Sheik has been an associate editor of the Cambridge Journal of Economics ever since its inauguration in 1977. He is a humane but principled person. I salute him unequivocally. The next one is from Dimitri Papadimitriou, 
is the currently president of the Levy Economic Institute of Bard College. He heads the Levy Institute's macroeconomic modeling team and has edited and contributed up to 13 books. In addition, he serves as Greece's he served as Greece's Ministry, Minister of Economy, Development, and Tourism from 2016 to 2018. I first met Anwar Anu Sheikh in 1973 when I took his class on international trade. He was intellectually sharp, charismatic in lecture after lecture, and rigorous, especially when questioning the conventional wisdom on the topics of exchange, rate determination, trade imbalances, transfers of value, and above all, comparative advantage. I didn't keep up with him until about the early 1980s when I invited him to give a talk at Bard College. The talk was very well attended, leaving students mesmerized while the faculty wondered where I had discovered him. The talk led to a year at Bard College as a visiting professor. Three years later, he spent another year at Simons Rock College at Bard, the Massachusetts campus at Bard, working on the book of Measuring the Wealth of na Nations, along with Ahmed Tonak, who was the economics professor there. During his time at Simons Rock, Anu and I had many interesting conversations about his economic insights ranging from production functions, theories of profit, um, and competition to the myth of free trade, but somehow always ending with the matter of my producing a dissertation for the PhD. <laughs> Anu used many reasons to convince me to get it done. To further persuade me, he offered to supervise the process. I, of course, thought he would be easy on me. Little did I know what it meant to have Anwar Sheikh as your PhD supervisor. He was deeply engaged in my dissertation, guiding me in every step of the way, but also severely criti critiquing my work, requiring me to rewrite whole chapters, he was tireless and conveyed an unbridled enthusiasm in our meetings, infectiously bringing me to explore various aspects and spend considerable amounts of time on input-output structures, as well as operationalizing with rigor Marx's economic categories. I am deeply grateful to him, as more of my work in later years instilled in me the importance of understanding Marx in relation to the real economic world. Our relationship continued when he spent some years working with Wynne Godley, others, and me at the Levy Economics Institute. In the words of Godley, Anwar has the gifts of a genius. Anu is brilliant, a deep thinker, always curious, widely read, challenging both orthodoxy and heterodoxy, following Marx's path, and making sense of the world we live in. The privilege to have worked alongside him and witnessed the command calm, confidence, enthusiasm, and commitment to his work was for me a singular <coughs> gift and honor. I'll just take a minute to present you. Um, everyone, of course, knows you already, but here it goes. We have Dayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics at UMass Amherst, author of over 20 books and 200 articles, and multi win award winner of multiple awards, including the most recent John Kenneth Galbraith Award of the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association in 2023. Her books include, out of the many, many, When Governments Fail, COVID-19 and the Economy, uh, and never done and poorly paid women's work in globalized India. Then we have here uh, Rama Vazudevan, who is currently a professor of economics at Colorado State University. She's the author of Things Fall Apart from the Crash of, 20, of 2008 to the Long Slump, and many articles on international finance, political economy, and development. And here we have, last but not least, Ahmed Taonak, Visiting Professor of the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Research Affiliate in Environmental Science and Policy at Smith College. In addition to many books and articles in Turkish, he with Anwar Sheikh uh, co-wrote Measuring the Wealth of Nations, the Political Economy of National Accounts in 1994 and edited Critical Perspective on the World Bank and the IMF in 2011. He has been an active voice against the military dictatorships in Turkey, as one of the founders of the Committee of Human Rights and Democracy in Turkey since 19, 19, the 1980s. Thank you very much for being here. We have 15 minutes each, um, and I will sit down there and 
tell you when you have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. national inequalities. So it's really those last three that I'm going to be looking at and in terms of how they have played out. <coughs> so let's look at the questions then. Is it actually true that competition is equalizing rates of return across different global locations, even for the same instrument, same financial instrument? Let's take, for example, bonds, okay? Is that true? Second, is in a world of mobile capital, which is driven dominantly by short-term considerations, can the real exchange rate be sustainable or even sustained over a reasonable period, let's say five, seven, ten years? But then if they are driven far away from fundamentals, as you noted, what are the drivers? Their macroeconomic policies, 
capitalist investor's perceptions of profit and risk, and I would argue power. Okay? Power determined by market influence, of course, economic power, but also by regulatory arbitrage and the ability to influence institutions, laws, and policies. And perhaps I will also ask then how these contribute to the persistent uneven development that we see today. So here is just one example of how this plays out. This is just government expenditure. Now we all know that supposedly capital markets are, so, are obsessed with fiscal deficits. Supposedly, okay? They're supposed to look at government debt to GDP ratios. They're supposed to be looking at primary deficits and, re and deciding that certain kinds of debt are sustainable or unsustainable on that basis. Here is a picture of the general government expenditure in the pre, immediately pre and post COVID period. As you can see, the high income countries had very large general government expenditure increases during COVID. I just, I can't resist giving this example. You know, on average, uh, the advanced economies increased their spending by as much as between 12 to 26 percent of GDP. The US alone spent 30, uh, no, sorry, $28,000 per capita between January 2020 and March 2021, okay? Uh, uh, 28,000. Low-income countries as a group spent $2 per capita additionally. <laughs> so when you look at share of GDP, it kind of hides that absolute difference, which is worth mentioning. And as you can see, middle and low-income countries have been much more reticent in terms of primary deficits. The primary deficit, as you can see on the right side, uh, doesn't, it goes up a little bit. Uh, all this low-income countries, and a bit more for middle-income countries, but that's dominantly in most countries because of loss of revenue during COVID, not because of more spending. Okay? So typically, it's the rich countries that have been much more profligate in that COVID period, and that shows in the general government debt to GDP, very high for the rich countries, already greater than GDP, going up to 123%, and staying pretty high at 112%. Low-income countries, very disciplined in that sense, extraordinarily disciplined at less than half of GDP, and barely going up, as you can see. And middle-income countries also pretty disciplined, at between 53, and it stays at 66%, which would be remarkable for a rich country today. Like we have countries like Japan, where it's in excess of 220% of GDP. Now, you would think that this kind of fiscal discipline should then be rewarded by the capital markets. <laughs> But let's see what happens. As you can see, the picture on the right-hand side is the spread on sovereign debt in basis points. Advanced economies, on average, the reason you can't see this move is because it doesn't. Okay? It stays below one basis point above the US Fed rate. The average of all the other advanced economies, the spread is literally below one basis point. It goes from 0 0.02 to 0 0.08 or 0 0.8, I think, at some point. But basically, you know, one basis point, okay? For the average of middle and low-income countries, there is one big spike in the middle of the COVID year, and then there is an enormous spike during the Ukraine war, okay? Which is when you also had the food and fuel price increases, which were related to the Euro Ukraine war, but not because of supply side, I, I would emphasize. In fact, some countries, it goes up to 1,100 basis points. So there is this massive punishing of the low and middle income countries by the capital markets, even though they've been as well behaved as possible according to the general paradigm. And if you look at the most recent spreads on sovereign bonds, the point really is that there is this mass, this is from the latest IMF World Economic Outlook, and it covers the period until January 2024 across the regions. You can see that Yes, emerging Europe was up the most, that's really because of the war in that period, July 2022. But look at the Middle East and, and uh, Central Asia, look at Sub-Saharan Africa, and in, at the spreads, and also the, the peak, what, are, what the army tends to call the whiskers, the extreme outliers within that group, go up substantially despite this extreme uh, fiscal discipline or consolidation. And this really happens because of other perceptions, which then become self-fulfilling. The minute capital decides that you're going to fail, you fail. It follows, right? 
There is another interesting point that comes out of this, which is that global capital flows, we all used to think of the US exorbitant privilege. And uh, there's an excellent article by Gaspar Rivas and Alice Sotano just come out, which really shows that it's actually the whole rich world's exorbitant privilege. As you can see, the rich countries are getting massive excess yields on their net foreign assets, whereas pretty much all of the middle and lower income countries, in this case, it's really the BRICS, are getting significant losses on their foreign assets. And the rich, this differential is not because the rich countries are investing in riskier, more profitable assets, it's because they get excess low interest debt, because they hold international reserve currencies. So these are really, if you like, senior rich gains or losses. Okay, even in the case of very successful countries, countries that are seen to be the globalization successes in Asia, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, these senior rich losses have been huge. If you look at Thailand, a huge success story, so-called. It's about 5% of GDP loss in this period, of the latest period of just pre-pandemic period. 5% of GDP more than the total net capital inflow is just the senior rich losses on the net foreign assets. So what determines them, I said, it's not because capital in these countries is more likely to be expropriated. It's not because of volatility and lower returns. In fact, despite depreciation, there are capital gains from investors from rich countries for three decades. It's not because of lower rates of return, but it's a privilege created by power. Not just geopolitical and military power, but power over the international institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, credit rating agencies, etc. Power over global rule setting, very important. Power of the ability to lobby for and ensure policies in lower income countries that are favorable for globally mobile capital. So power is that extra economic factor, which has major effects on competition in global capital markets. And it reinforces uneven development just as it has throughout the history of capitalism. So my question really then, to Anwar and I guess to all of us, can we now model this power because it is so critical? It, it is what determines these deviations from the so-called fundamentals. And if we can model it, or maybe more importantly, how do we then curb it? Thank you. You want to be here. It's an honor and Rama, Rama, Mike. Rama, Mike. Here it's on the it's on the table. <laughs> okay. It's on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. So it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um and celebrate on Mark's legacy. It's not on. Oh, I think you have to hold it like a pop star, you know? Yeah. No, hold it, hold it like a pop star, like this. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, actually, at the celebration of Anwar's legacy, this, this radical alternative framework for, for understanding the turbulent dynamics of capitalism on the basis of conflict, crisis, and competition. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of what we said about his ideas, but I also want to outset say something about how Anwar has touched people's lives. And I don't just mean, um, I mean, of course, the students, but um, equally important, it's intellect, I mean, it is scholars and activists across the global south. I mean, Anwar has been kind of an inspiration to lift the imaginations 
of, sc of scholars and activists across the global south. And I mean, analysis can be very empowering, right? So I first read uh, Anbar on the Humpback production function and the transformation problem when I was a, a student at, uh, at the Center for Development Studies, where Gita Sen and Sharangeet Sen and the New School alumni were professors. And there's been this hushed, wide-eyed talk about this next project of Anwar and Bernac, uh, on, on which would kind of change the way you thought you looked at national income accounts. Now, I spent the next decade of my life, I mean, I was completely hooked from that point on, but I spent the next decade of my life as an activist, primarily as an activist. And it was many years before I agreed measuring the wealth of nations. But before that happens, the late Chibar, right here, came to India carrying this fat sheet of photocopied, transcribed lectures of Anwar's here at the New School. And he got it for this bunch of us. And we used to, it was guarded, we used to guard it zealously, fight over who would have it next, and it set off a storm of debate. And for me, I mean, I cut my teeth on Lenin, Baran, and Sweezy, and the Monthly Review. And these lectures upended my worldview completely. And so I was still kind of, my focus still on imperialism, but now I had to try and understand it, you know, on the basis of real competition and not monopoly capital. So um, uh, Anwar visited India and had this lovely lunch and conversation with him. And when I finally decided I wanted to do a PhD, of course, the school was where I wanted to be. It was the only place to be. And I emailed uh, Anwar with these really grandiose ideas of what I wanted to do in my PhD. Anwar, this time gentle, not fierce, he wrote me this really kind, long email, telling me very gently, it's all very well, but I could not rewrite Marx in classic. <laughs> <laughs> and so here I came. <laughs> and it was with some trepidation that I kind of um, I present this talk because what I'm doing is again trying to to theorize capitalist monopoly on the basis of real competition. Okay. Now the monopoly capital school, uh, I mean. The, is basically trying to look at this trend of the emergence of large corporations as a dominant mode of organizing uh, uh, production and surplus in capitalism, and uh, oligopolistic price setting and non-price competition and market power is the basis. It's the antithesis of perfect competition. But if we start from this analytically distinct theorization of real competition uh, that shape points to, this is characterized by aggressive cost cutting rather than passive price taking. So you cannot understand capitalist monopoly as the capacity to set prices or market power. So I, what I want to do is extricate the analysis of uh, capitalist monopoly from theorization based on market dominance and market share and ground it in the underlying um, structure of production and property rights that restrict the mobility of capital. So competition, as Sheikh kind of emphasizes, the reciprocal actions of many capitals upon each other in the turbulent process of self-regulation, order and disorder. Now for Marx, for Marx, the uh, competition played a big role in dismantling feudal and mercantile monopoly. This was one role. The second role was in expressing the inner tendencies of capitalism as an external coercive force. And here the tendency of the equalization of profit rates across the regulating capitals and the mobility of capital establish the gravitational centers for the ceaseless fluctuation of prices. Now Sheikh has shown how competition, real competition, is compatible with both persistent differences of profitability and is associated with high concentration and with higher uh, profit margins. Foley had also pointed to this uh, kind of this inherent externality uh, in this process, which make every capitalist, uh, individual capital, a kind of a free rider. 
the surplus of growth created by individual capitals is decoupled from the surplus directly extracted by them. It is determined by the aggregate pool of surplus value, which is determined by the exploitation of capital in the aggregate and workers in the aggregate. And this is where the significance of um, the extraction of surplus profits and its transformation into rents, monopoly rents, becomes important. For Marx pointed to two sources of surplus profit, prop capital producing under the most favorable conditions of uh, production, and uh, capitals that await the, uh, the, the reduction of their uh, rate of profit to the average level in the process of competition, which was his theory of rent. So, um, capitalist monopoly is theorized by Smith in terms of restrictions, trade protections, colonial trade policy, exclusive privileges granted to joint stock companies. The key thing is it's not based on a single seller. For Marx, again, capitalist monopoly is the outcome of competition. It's a negation of both feudal mercantilist uh, monopoly and capitalist competition. It's a synthesis and associated with a fuller expression of the laws of competition rather than their suspension. And the two things here are artificial and uh, natural monopolies. Artificial monopoly being the legal and institutional barriers uh, that impede the mobility of capital and prevent market prices from falling to the level of the underlying price of the production. And the theory of differential rent in Ricardo is generalized to industry in terms of differential profit with profitability, but but has its basis, natural basis in land and the fertility and location of land. It is, um, the key point is that it is established through the competition of capitals by the establishment of a, co a, a uniform competitive <coughs> price. And um, absolute, uh, uh, absolute rents arise independently of differential productivity from landed property's resistance to the equalization of profit rates and the leveling down of the of price to the price of production. And it's based on the back, backward, uh, low, uh, lower running cap proposition of capital in the sector. But this is a historical basis, and it can disappear. So is there something more kind of durable with the development of capitalism? Because capitalism doesn't just take pre-existing landed property and transform it into land, rent, it can also create new property rights. Most importantly, property rights and knowledge and intangible capital, both of which are, I mean, which are non-rival and non-exhaustible and non-excludable. But property rights restrict access. And the excess profits which arise from, uh, from, from different production conditions get cemented in the form of monopoly rents to these property rights. But, we still, but capitalism also means the development of technologies that unleash the social productivity of labor above the average level. And that is the basis of <coughs> natural monopoly. Characterized by economies of scale and scope, network externalities, and large and issue capital outlays. They arise from real competition and the capitalist mode of organizing production on an ever larger scale. And they're rational from the standpoint of capitalist social relations. They embody the tremendous productive possibilities of capitalist production productions. And uh, the archetypal example at the time of Marx was railways and digital platforms. I mean, what railways, now we have digital platforms. Concentration and centralization pays the way for the, the, natural, the consolidation of natural monopolies, and the credit system is key. It doesn't just, it's not just a new and terrible weapon in the battle of competition, it's also transformed into an enormous social mechanism of centralization and leads to the legal institutional form of the joint stock company, which was the precursor of the modern monopoly. In the, in the uh, monthly review school, it, is, it invalidates Marx's theory of value and the laws of competition, but as Clifton has shown that is a better approximation of real competition. So capitalist monopoly in the form of the modern corporation is not just a simple antithesis of real competition, but a contradictory uh, synthesis. 
negation of feudal mercantile monopolies with the rise of capitalist competition and the negation of real capitalist competition with a new mode of organizing capitalist production which impedes capital mobility, enabling the extraction of monopoly rents. Capitalist development creates both the social need and the technical means for such capitalist monopolies. It's an organizational form particularly suited to harnessing natural monopolies. It is private production without the control of private property. Social cap capital applied by those who are not its owners and who therefore proceed quite unlike them. And this is because the corporation is also a financial entity. It's a bundle of assets. Share ownership grants uh, rights to future earnings. And the, this, uh, the joint stock company of the corporation is also creates barriers uh, to the equalization of profit rates because uh, enterprises can remain viable even if they earn only the prevailing rate of interest. And this is even if the stock, the, uh, the equity, is, is kind of uh, the arbitrage or equalize, uh, equalizes the return to the dividend plus uh, capital, um, capital gains, uh, in, in, as, as Anwar has shown, even then, there's, within the corporate structure, there is this barrier, which, which has been seen as a counteracting factor to the tendency of falling rate of profit. So corporations capture monopoly rents from ownership of both financial and intangible capital, even if profitability remains close to the uh, prevailing rate of interest. And capitalist monopoly is asserted not only by cornering a larger share of the aggregate surplus value produced in the form of monopoly rents, but also by posing a counterforce to falling profitability in the aggregate. Finally, it offers this form offers the route for finance to command and uh, uh, through this uh, structure. And there's enough, enough uh, empirical evidence now, there's the work of Vitali et al, on how financial institutions constitute a three quarter of the core of 147 interconnected companies and 40% of net wealth. 2% of top shareholders cumulatively own 80% of global economic value, Brigaccio et al. And finally, uh, work by Gibaldina, which looks at asset management funds, not, uh, and, and shows that um, uh, they have expanded their share in companies from in which they held equity stakes from 56% to 81%, and the largest owner, that share rose from 4% to 40%. And this has given rise to the discussion of common uh, ownership. Uh, so minority stakes and horizontal shareholdings across corporations competing in the same sector. This, but more important, is not anti-competitive effects, but the command it gives to finance over global corporate network. And that there'll be the squeeze on labor at the portfolio and industry level. Again, work has shown that. And the mechanisms are the standard shareholder mechanisms. There's a higher likelihood of shared directors. There are mechanisms of passive influence which is characteristic of diffuse ownership. And what this has is echoes of the holding system and the opaque web of interlocking directorships that Lenin talked about in, uh, when he's talking about imperialism. And so, we have real comp uh, capitalist competition, basis of capitalist monopoly, both artificial and natural. Corporations as embodiments of this contradictory synthesis allowing finance to command this corporate network. So, I found my way from Anwar back to Lennon. <laughs> In a way, I told you I said this with trepidation, but thank you Anwar for being teacher, mentor, and friend. <laughs>
Uh, you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Okay, greetings to everyone. Uh, I thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this once in a lifetime gathering. And I especially thank Mark for tolerating my emails with so many logistical questions. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> let me start first talking about my relationship with Anu briefly. It's, it's a long relationship, almost 50 years, by the way. And those also good old days at the new school. I see some of my classmates here in the audience. And then I'll uh, move to my paper on profit and alienation, which was originally written, as you see here, with a former undergraduate student of mine, Ayn Perzaman, from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. Mm -hmm. And I literally mailed him here, uh, not New School, but University Amherst, and he did his PhD at Amherst. Now he's a full professor uh, in Israel, uh, one of the beautiful cities on the Aegean coast. Some pretty friends agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, because of the time limitations, I'll be very brief about my paper with Alper. And it is also recently published in the Review of Radical Political Economics and available uh, online. <clears throat> Probably uh, some of you, many of you, read this book. Uh, as you see, it is by Orhan Pabuk. Orhan. Uh, happened to be my schoolmate uh, in Istanbul, and he got later Nobel Prize in 2016 in literature. And I read a couple of different places actually uh, that the first sentence of the novel uh, is crucial for capturing readers' attention and setting the tone. Uh, where is the first sentence here? <laughs> so I read a book one day and my whole life was changed. Uh, that almost happened to me. Uh, I say almost because then I met with Anwar uh, in 1975 and he didn't have any book published yet. And he was 30 years old and I was 24 and I think uh, started teaching at the new school three years earlier, uh, and then even finished his PhD later, I think, uh, uh, two years uh, before 1973. Uh, but that meeting you know, changed literally my life in many ways, because I met with him, and since then it continued uh, being so, because we get together in many ways, doing many different things, and I'll just mention one of them in a minute. Uh, obviously, first I was his student, and then I became his first paid teaching assistant, paid on the line, because obviously there were uh, informal teaching assistants at the time, but New School was paying nothing for those, so I was the first paid one, and then later I became his first paid research assistant. And this was the early 1970s, mid-1970s at the New School. And since then, uh, in addition to being my dissertation supervisor, obviously, he's been my mentor throughout. <clears throat> Eventually, uh, as already mentioned, we became co-authors. Uh, some articles, more importantly for me especially, uh, the book on political economy of nation accounts, uh, measuring the wealth of nations, published in 19. 94, and then we were housemates many times. And nowadays, we are also poundmates in Amherst, Massachusetts. And it's lived two miles away from my house this last summer. <clears throat> At the time, a couple of things about the new school, in the mid uh, and late 1970s, most of the students were not Americans. Uh, let me be politically incorrect, and we were foreign students, okay. and Greeks, Turks, including myself, Pakistanis, Chileans, Brazilians, and Argentinians. Uh, there is something common among these people, and in all of those countries at the time, we had military regimes. So we were 
uh, in many instances, positive exiles or self exile types. And we had also many Iranian friends. Uh, they were forced to leave their country because of the totalitarian Islamic regime at the time in Iran. <laughs> Here is a photo of us, some of us, I should say, uh, 10 years later, 1985. Uh, this is uh, around the campus of uh, Bart College in Great Barrington, smaller campus, those are the forgiveness students. Gilbert is not in the audience, so <laughs> I could say that. Uh, great Barrington, uh, Massachusetts. And the youngest person there is my son, Ali, uh, now 43 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and the other person is my co author and comrade, uh, Sungur Sagan, who, by the way, is a visiting professor and uh, also taught at the music a couple of times. Let me move to the paper itself. Uh, in radical political economy, profit on alienation uh, is not mentioned much. And I see, for example, in the last, even the last two papers, could have utilized profit on alienation. And I'll try to uh, touch up on the table in passing, so I'm sure you could catch it. Uh, this situation is understandable because uh, Marx emphasizes surplus value as the fundamental source of profit. Uh, however, in theories of surplus value, the first book that Marx discusses for James Stewart, uh, he deals with a uh, concept quite a few in And based on these discussions, especially in theories of surplus value, but other places in passing when Marx uh, discussed this uh, concept, Sheik uh, argued that Marx has two concepts of profit. Uh, in two different types of exchanges. The first one, obvious one, which we all use, <clears throat> based on surplus value in the context of new wealth production through equal exchange between capital and labor power. And the other one is the one that I'm focusing here, based on unequal exchange between the buyer and seller. Uh, the context is obviously here, wealth transfer rather than wealth production. <clears throat> Uh, Anwar uh, uses concept many different places. Uh, some of the older uses, for example, 1984 article on neoliberalism, uh, the book edited by Ernest Manuel and Adam Freeman, uh, 1986 uh, there was an entry uh, to the New Poetry uh, Dictionary, and in both. Context 1984 and 1986, uh, discussion evolved around transformation problem. As you know, one of the expected equalities uh, in the transformation problem is the equality between uh, profit and surplus value. Uh, Hard to get that equality unless you do some acrobatics. And so Anwar explained, especially in equality between total surplus value and total profit by referring to the presence of uh, profit and alienation. And obviously also he used in his recent book, 2016, many times, I think I counted nine times, profit and alienation, so it's not an old category. He abandoned, he still has this concept, he uses profit and alienation. And, but also in our book, 1994, uh, both in the context of transformation problem, but also incarnation, trade, and unequal exchange. And the Jayaki's paper, for example, is about that. And there's a reference to profit and alienation as well. <coughs> uh, this is what we did in that paper. I mean, this is the original part of it now. Uh, as you see, we started with profit and alienation. Uh, it is also sometimes called profit upon expropriation. Yeah. And Kostas Lapavitsas, a friend of mine from Greece, and in his uh, last book, actually the one before the last, now there's a new one, Profiting Without Producing. Uh, in that book also he used this concept. And I talked to him a couple of times and exchanged emails, and he also 
observed that there was a need, there is a need to operationalize this concept. So that's what we are attempting in this particular very uh, minimal way. Uh, in the neoliberal era, as we all know, and I don't like the concept very much, uh, many governments privatize public land. Uh, that's our first case. The state sells the land for less than its value, they have to this developer, and then the developer takes this land, either sitting on it a little bit or maybe not, and uh, sells the land uh, at its market value, which happens to be larger than original paid amount. And so that in itself constitutes profit and alienation. But some other developers get something on this land, such as hotel, for example. So in that case, you have profit upon alienation, right hand side, last column, <coughs> I'm sorry, left, left or right, according to you. Uh, because there is a wealth production in, in the form of you know, hotel on that land, so there is also profit based on surplus value. So the end result of this transaction, building something on the land or selling the land at its market value, you have a situation that uh, public wealth decreased, uh, but at the same time, total profit uh, increased. And the other case, and uh, also I think important phenomenon, uh, last 30, 40 years, because real wages were relatively constant in many places and increased, uh, banking institutions lent to workers. Then they lent to workers. And obviously they charge interest, and then the principal paid and interest paid. Let's focus on interest itself. So interest paid by these you know, working you know, households, depending upon who they are. If they are, for example, product, productive workers, obviously interest, interest itself comes out of variable capital. If they are unproductive workers, given the fact that their rate is paid out of surplus value, this interest paid out of you know, surplus value uh, to the banks. <coughs> Independent of who pays uh, from what, these interests themselves constitute profit alienation, according to our argument. And this leads to a situation that uh, net wages, and that the standard of living workers will go down because of this transaction, which is obviously quite substantial, as you know, but at the same time, profit uh, goes up. Now, let me share you a <coughs> couple of results. Uh, so that uh, we could see whether this is significant and worthwhile to explore. For the period that we studied, 2011 to 2021, the average ratio of profit and alienation to total profits uh, in Turkey was almost 9%. So it's not insignificant. And actually in 2016, it's all the way to 13%. Moreover, uh, looking at 2019, as I indicated there, uh, the share of total for profit as a percentage of GDP was around you know, 9% and then for the valuation was around you know, 1%. Uh, so it is not something that you know, we, we should ignore. I think you know, we should one way or another try to incorporate our analysis. I find this rather fruitful area to explore. And obviously the total of the alienation based on these two cases, real estate and finance, uh, when we add the numbers, uh, it fluctuates. And the reason it fluctuates uh, related to land values, and interest rates, and workers' capacity to borrow, you know, all kinds of you know, things. But sometimes $4 billion roughly, and sometimes all the way $7 billion, given the fact that Turkish economy is not a small economy, but it's not a big economy either. And I think they could, although our GDP reach a trillion dollars, but in this period around $700 billion. So it's a substantial amount. Uh, <clears throat> let me finish this uh, <clears throat> by looking at this land per se and loss to workers. I think profit and alienation, and especially concretizing it and and pre estimating in different kind of context, uh, adds some economic you know, substance, and I will even claim some analytical content to extremely politicized and full of you know, sociological you know, analysis uh, built in. Take, for example, David Hardy's concept accumulation by dissociation, which was a Luxembourg original idea. Now we have an ability to see the extent of it. And in the case of non workers, you know, there is a value and wealth you know, transfer. 
uh, from workers to you know back in institutions, and then modify the estimation of rate of surplus value. I'm one of those who still believe that rate of surplus value is the important category to know what it is, especially in political work. When we talk to workers, and I do occasionally, uh, we say that we got exploited, but how much, right? And uh, through what kind of relations? I think this gives us a kind of an edge and superiority uh, going beyond the other sort of rate of surplus value estimated exclusively on equal exchange and relationship between labor and capital. So let me stop here. Thank you. We have a whole half an hour for discussion. So if the speakers would like to take a seat, Anwar, would you like to say something? <coughs> that I have cancer influence in people's thoughts and that it has caused them to approach the world in a somewhat different way. That was my purpose. And I never claimed or nor would want to claim <clears throat> that what I tried to do is a sort of biblical statement of everything being true. I, I want to show that there are very powerful rivers in capitalism that emanate from competition. And like powerful rivers, we need to look where they abandon and where they overflow. And the point is that they also continue to flow. You can dam up a river and then when you stop there for the fill somewhere else, the water has to go. And you, you can keep the dam with some power for a while, but you have to use power to keep it. And uh, power in this sense obstruction. So in that sense, uh, I'm always struck by the fact that uh, power appears associated with size, that is, a size of capital. Because I've long argued that it isn't associated with size of capital. I mean, the business literature is very clear. If you look at the literature they have on uh, size of American capital, let's say, and profit rates, that large capitalists have lower profit rates. They have lower profit rates, but they also have less volatility. And if you adjust for volatility, a standard adjustment in, uh, in business literature, there's no difference. So why is it that American <coughs> corporations, the most powerful corporations in the world, the ones who dominate the world, supposedly, have the same profit rate as small? And I argue that that is because competition does not require capital in a big industry to come from in a big firm to stay in itself. It goes wherever the money is. I mean, Walmart is very, very big. It's also the cheapest source of commodities because it competes with all the other producers and beats them by being big and having lower prices. Not higher prices, but lower prices. And its profit arrives from the size. And the size gives it the power to be more ruthless, to include this point. They don't care what they produce. Bananas, cars, electric batteries, it doesn't matter. They make the money from beating the market. So from my point of view there, first, large size is not the source of excess profits in itself. So then the question is, uh, is there a power that can give them anything other than the size? That's a state, yes. The state, as Alan's paper points out, the state can, in fact, give privilege to uh, some corporation, not always large, but anyway, privilege. And that privilege is a barrier to the equalization of property rights because they're not they're protected. But on the other hand, 
It is an attractor to other big capitals not with this privilege. And people forget that. It's not that big capitals control the world. Big capitals hate each other, and they eat each other. And we forget that. And in that moment of looking where some has a higher privilege, and then they get eaten, and there's another one that's a higher privilege, we think that size creates the privilege, but it doesn't. It gives you a limited space, which is then attacked by everyone else. Anyone in Washington who's ever seen lobbyists knows that their job is to get their privilege. And the other job they have is to take it away from others who have the privilege. And that's really quite a intense strategy. So uh, I am not persuaded that the patterns that you see in the uh, uh, interest rates that you have talked about and the patterns that Rama talked about. Uh, uh, Rama and I had this argument along the way. 30 years ago, <laughs> or 40 years ago in India. And I'm, I'm impressed that I haven't changed my mind in any way. I think what you have to do is go step by step. And the step by step, is, uh, as Pramit talks about in his paper, is to talk about the foundation and then talk about the series of other phenomena that are derived from there. You can't leave, because then you're missing the connection. And I believe that it's possible to show without the use of power why interest rates are so powerfully equalized, subject to risk and other things. I mean, Greece doesn't get the same interest rate as Germany in Eastern in Europe. But that is a reason. Greece was clearly uncompetitive when it entered the EU. And this is what you just said, they're very clear. The other phenomena, I mean, I, I can't talk about everything here because I didn't absorb all of this. I would love to look again at this higher deals and so on, which I haven't done, so I can't say whether I understand it. But as I said, uh, I definitely have looked at capitalist science, and it's just not true. What, what the confusion is the following. My whole work has been designed to show that you cannot start from the classical theory and approach the world, because then the world is a negation of the theory. So I have tried to show that there was another foundation. Marx, but also Smith and Ricardo, that explain these phenomena, and they, you can incorporate them, and then you can bring in concrete factors, no question. But it doesn't follow that these concrete factors are the negation of competition. You're often riding on top of them, and switching sides, and you have to look for that. I mean, I think uh, the EU is a very good example of that kind of thing. So, um, uh, interest rates have many determinants. But one thing you know is that uh, if an interest rate is set in a large pool somewhere, then other interest rates have to deal with that. Because capital doesn't have to flow. It, it's, as Mark called it, it's uh, fungible, it's fluid. And if it's not getting a good rate of return somewhere else, it will try to get it you know, a better one, and often can break down the barriers. On one hand, you say capital is very powerful. On the other hand, you say stake is not capital. I don't think that's true uh, for an extended period of time. But I, I confess that I have not uh, looked at these rates, uh, and I'm uh, going to do it now, because I've been pointing in the direction of the, uh, the this is my argument. Um, I'm, I'm stuff is closer to what I would argue, uh, because I've always, I noted Mark's senses, that Marx is not writing about merchant capital. And yet capitalism, in that sense, is thousands of years old. That was the foundation of, of the uh, uh, Wallerstein school, that the idea that capitalism has always been there. Of course, there was Arab capitalism, and Greek capitalism, and Chinese capitalism, in this sense that it was merchant capitalism. But merchant capital has a privilege, which is that it starts in the center, and exchanges things which are cheap in the center, like glass marbles or mirrors or weapons, and takes it to places which are not connected to that same production process, and gets gold and furs. I mean, they said that very clearly. But then they have to protect their roots. Because if they don't protect their roots, then competition takes away. So how do they protect their roots? They get pirates. They get armies. So this is uh, profit by force. And it's based on the idea that it's unequal exchange. So the two sides are not connected. Of course, competition can work in that same way. But it also erodes that. 
we forget the development is about the erosion of that difference uh, through the, the spread of capitalism. Once capitalism, industrial capitalism spread, then you got another set of capitalists with, and I long argued that it is not true that uh, the developing world uh, has a, a, a deficiency in terms of profitability. It has many deficiencies, and, and I'm going to talk about some of that in terms of development. You know. But the whole prebish, singular notion that the terms of trade are biased against uh, uh, the developing world is simply, in my opinion, wrong because it misunderstands the whole idea of the theory of life, which is very abstract. Here's an example of this. Marx and Engels used to write to each other every day. And you know, in those days, you sent a letter out in the morning, it went from London to Manchester, Engels answered me and came back. Do you think you can do that in, in the US now, in New York City? They were efficient then. And one of the letters that Marx writes to Engels, he says, Dear Fred, I've been thinking about Ricardo's theory of rent. And Ricardo's theory of rent is based on the privilege, on the principle that if a country expands, it goes from good land to worse land to worse land. And therefore, when you need to produce something, you produce on the worst land in use. Worst land in use. And that land has, uh, gets uh, 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 low rent. But the better land, which cannot be expanded because it is by definition already used up, will have a privilege. A privilege not from power, but privilege from higher fertility, and so on. And that's the principle of mining. And Marx is very clear about that. And I discuss this in my book. So then the issue comes up of different of absolute rent. Now there are like five phrases in Marx about absolute rent, and people have built whole careers around these phrases. But it seemed to be, and I did this, tried to do this 30 years ago, you have to ask what's the operative principle. And in my opinion, the operative principle is the same as differential rent. Differential rent is because the land here has uh, the conditions that it can be reproduced, where the better land can't be, so they get a privilege of that. The, good, the land on the margin has a higher property, a higher price. So the other land is now selling at that higher price, and it has lower cost, it makes uh, absolute uh, differential rent. And this, Ricardo points out, is a necessary consequence of competition. And then Marx says, well, but what capitalist is going to be operating on land that the landlord's going to give him to uh, to uh, make profit and not get paid to land rent. Why would you do that? And there, there is a principle, in my opinion, which has not been developed in the literature, which is the, what I call the infra rent, which is that if you have land and you have to pay the land rent, how much do you pay the land rent? And the answer is the difference between the land in use and the next available land in use. That's simply an extension of rent. And Marx sort of hints to that, but look, um, Marx says a lot of things he never followed up on because he never finished his damn work. That's one reason it took me so long to finish this book. I didn't want to die before I finished, but I didn't want to finish before I died. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do it. And so people take these phrases and make them religious. And I think that's a mistake. So we have to confront how we can develop the theory to the same level of concretion. And God knows there's many different levels of concretion, many different phenomena. I'm going to talk later uh, in my uh, interview about inequality by gender, class, and race. Okay, that's my new work, and I want to show it fits perfectly in the old framework because it is a device that maintains some aspect of it and political struggle that changes it. And I want to show the unity of those. I'm going to show you again. Every year in the United States, up to the present, the same patterns. And yet changes because struggles for uh, more equality changes some, one aspect of my theory. So I've gone on too long, um, but you see one of the things people say is well, I not to agree. We can't hear you on the live stream. Sorry, I've gone on too long, but as you see, this is a characteristic of mine. I don't agree with everything, even if people say they got it from me. <laughs> so we still have 15 minutes, 16 to be precise. So I don't know if the, would you guys like to respond or should we open it up? Let's open it up. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. 
And maybe you could say who you are just because. Hi, yeah, everybody. Paul Lusson, an associate professor of economics here in the department. Anwar, I don't have enough time here. Unfortunately, we would have more time, but I did want to say three things by way of a uh, profound uh, scholarly and personal appreciation for the time I've had to learn from you. First year in the department, we, we live in the house that you built. And we know it. We know there was a lot of shit eaten in building that department, a lot of stubbornness, and a lot of an uncompromising belief in the historical signif significance of an intellectual project. And for that, we thank you. Second, as somebody who worked here now for nine years and had the privilege to interact with you, there are things that one learns from reading the published work of scholars. And there are things that we learn by the water cooler in informal conversations. It's kind of the, 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 the making of the movie. And a lot of those things stay with you. And, and, and I, I realize that the, the, the people who have had a great deal of influence over my own thinking are, are the people who keep talking to me in my head when I'm trying to figure things out. And there are two things, at least, that keep coming up that I want to share with you. The first one is your point that in many ways what the task of a radical Marxist-inspired political economy is to work towards the development of abstractions that capture truths that are robustly indifferent to the micro-level detail of the functioning of economies. In other words, things that are true socially. The second thing, and I'm so happy Tanak is here as well because it's of that contribution, that we need to be incredibly diligent in thinking through the relationship between the categories that we construct as we build abstraction and that which we may hope to observe. Not out of a Popperian belief in falsifiability as a criterion for establishing truth, but as an analytical discipline that is too often missing in all strains of economic thought. I'm a methodologist, I realize, uh, so it comes out like this when I start uh, speaking. And finally, um, and I hope you appreciate this, Alma. Um, I think all of us who are of a radical disposition and, and find ourselves with the privilege and the time to engage in intellectual matters um, kind of wish we were living in different times. We look at Hilfrey, we look at Lenin, Luxembourg, we look at Trotsky, we look at Bukharin, people who were in a position not only to think things out, but to try and change the world on the basis of those contributions. A lot of us have not been afforded the privilege, uh, which means that we get to live into old age. That's a plus. But not without some sense of frustration. In that context, Anwar, I want to salute a specific type of courage that you have shown. The courage to be in an intellectual minority. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the courage of the absolute absence of an immediate reward be a pecuniary or for that matter in terms of broader social recognition and to stand by belief and the courage to understand Anwar and I, and I say this from the bottom of my heart that often the impact that us radicals make in the world is not measured by the immediate effect we have in social life but in generations thank you Questions, and I'll follow uh, for the high bar. You can also <laughs> <laughs> ask uh, questions from the panel. Yes, please. I just wanted to know another thing about the 70s, 80s at mm -hmm. uh, the new school of the difference between uh, the times now and then. I just uh, made a list as I was listening to the other speakers uh, of the professors that I took courses with them. Believe it or not, most of them are also foreigner. <laughs> Starting with Anwar, born in Pakistan, Gita Sen from India, Thomas Viatoris from Hungary, and there was a mathematical economist from Greece, Costa, but I forgot his last name, and Alfredo Nigio from Italy, mm -hmm. and two Germans, first Heinrich Lanzmann, and then Billy, that is for 
good. And then John Eatwell, for a while. And then, believe it or not, also I took a course in the summer, Kamala Harris's father. It was the only other American professors I had at the time, Howard Warner and David Schwartzman, Ross Thompson, unfortunately died in a very early. We spent a year reading a few versions of Kafka my first year, obliged, required, of course. And then David Gordon also died quite early. And Edward Nell. I just wanted to share this. I was privileged to be in this part of this room. It was unique. I'm sorry. I was privileged to be in the department like this. It was unique. And it was also full of intense, violent battles. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question here. Yes. Say your name. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Liz Cooper. I'm actually an incoming New School student. and. Um, I'm wondering, uh, pardon me if I'm stepping on a uh, dispute within the field I haven't quite caught up to, that uh, the specific sequence of uh, surplus value extraction and distribution as profits is a, a logical sequence as opposed to a chronological sequence um, in March itself. And so my question to, I suppose to knock and shake, because my understanding is that's the, the, you were working on this general, the flow chart you were presenting earlier, is, is the, Extraction of rent the, or the distribution of um, land value to capitalists by my understanding is by the state as a means that kind of like precedes the surplus value extraction process. Where do you situate that within the capital cycle, so to speak? Is it a chronological process that precedes the surplus value extraction process, or are you fitting it into the logical sequence of surplus value extraction? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm not, I want to uh, continue the disagreement, if I may. <laughs> um, I did not mention size at all. Size is irrelevant in this argument. It doesn't matter the size of the financial investor. We are looking at rates of return on exactly the same assets, sovereign bonds, across different locations. And, uh, okay, let me put it to you this way. Here is Imagine an investor investing in either U.S. Treasury bills or sovereign bonds of Thailand or Malaysia. The U.S. has been running current account deficits for the last, well, very long time, but let's take the last 20 years. Thailand and Malaysia have been running current account surpluses of significant size for the last 20 years. An investor who invested in U.S. Treasury bills would get a, a, I mean, or rather, put it the other way, an investor investing in Thailand or Malaysia would get a rate of return at least five times that from US Treasury bills, whether you look at 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, or five years. To me, that is a major thing that needs to be explained. And yes, you can say it's a dam that is you know, stopping a river and the water is flowing somewhere else. Or you can say that it is power conferring rents through unequal exchange expressed in financial transactions. I mean, you can call it, you know, profit or alienation, etc. Frankly, I don't care, I mean, anymore. I don't even care if people call me a Marxist or not anymore. I, I'm tired of the labeling. I just want to understand the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to me, this is something that needs explanation. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, the conversation maybe stuck in 30 years ago, <laughs> but I think I have learned something, I hope. And part of the project was, was actually, I mean, again, um, it's about um, understanding not in terms of market power, not in terms of size, but in terms of organizational structure, which is the corporate form. And the, I mean, the classical notions of artificial and na uh, natural monopoly, and not the neoclassical notions. And, and that, I think, is the, I mean, I would again uh, leave, uh, leaves open the path for finance to, to, to come up. I mean, so, so that's the point. But, and um, and this does not kind of in, in any way mean that competition 
and the competition of capital is not happening, because, because I think at some level that's more intense. But it is about how the, co the, the corporate form has, has kind of imposed on this, on this logic, without, without in any way kind of um, destroying it or quelling it. and I am currently associate professor at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at the University College London, but I'm Argentinian, and I wanted to echo something that Paul has said, because I think, and I was checking my emails, maybe you remember better, but I think it was 2009 um, that you went to Argentina, actually, invited by the Escuela de Economía Política, which is like a critical gathering of uh, students and also faculty, trying to fight internally at the University of Buenos Aires for heterodox economic thinking. And I remember how full the auditorium was in, in your talk, but above all, I remember how happy the students were. And I think that in terms of the generations, you cannot, I mean, although it may seem small to be at the new school in New York and very far from the reality of a lot of people, I, yeah, I just wanted to share this anecdote many, many years after uh, that talk because I really know that for my generation at least, it was meaningful and it really led us to think and develop ideas in a different way. So, yeah, thank you. they would have a lower rate of return in business in, in the uh, U.S. Treasuries, U.S. Uh, and a higher rate of return in Thailand. They have an answer, by the way. They don't do it because of the golden privilege. They do it because some benefit that they get from it, including security and uh, in the U.S. And the Chinese invest here. They can invest anywhere in the world. No one's going to stop them. They invest here because it's a very safe and uh, long-term productive thing. And in many developing worlds, it's not long term. They have to, the risk is not from the volatility. The risk is of the existence of a change in the conditions and the ability to protect. So uh, the first thing I would do is look at business literature and have them explain to me why they're going to lose all these gains. And I have read some of that. And they do it very carefully. It's not a loss. It's a, uh, a calculation. Now, the same thing applies to stocks and bonds. There's a lower rate of return for bonds than there is for stocks. That's called the equity bond premium puzzle. It actually dominates the financial literature. I can show what that is. And I, you know, it has a lot of empirical evidence in it that derives from how you determine the rate of interest on bonds and how that's different uh, than the rate of interest on the stock market, let's say the rate of return on the stock market because there's a different operating principle. But they are linked exactly to the same process, which is competition. Now, you know, uh, I, I'm not saying that this is right, but my, the way I proceed to first show how competition works concretely, theoretically, and empirically, and then see where there are specific factors. I, I disagree completely that the corporation has power to have a privilege. I don't think that's true. And I've, as much as the rates of return, which is after all the most important thing to them, but a variety of other things where they have space for a while and then it's taken away from others. Tesla, wonderful car. I could never afford it myself, but it's a wonderful car and a great concept. They're losing out everywhere in the world after a while. The iPhone produced in China, low cost. Steve Jobs says, well, I can't produce it anywhere. It's already been copied. 
and, and undercut everywhere. So you can't think of competition as something that happens momentarily. It's a conflict of, among mafias. <laughs> and you need to talk about the killing and the replacement. But the point is, it is like a river. You dam it up in one place and it builds up in another. And I believe you can show this completely. That does not mean that you can explain everything. It's not a religious principle. It's a principle of the science. And like any science, there are phenomena that are difficult to explain, but I don't think that means that they're outside of that necessarily. You have to approach it more carefully. I hope to I moved to Jaffa's neighborhood in Amherst, so I can be close to that. So we will have this discussion again. Thank you, everyone. We have another few minutes for the coffee break, and then we resume for the last session of the morning. Thank you.